how do we best support and include our LGBTQ colleagues along the medical training journey? How do we best combat systemic discrimination as we continue throughout our careers? How do we foster an inclusive and supportive institution? Learn the answers to these questions and many more on this episode of the Talk To Me Doc podcast. Welcome to the Talk To Me Doc podcast, where it's all about serving the early career physician. Let's talk about the unique issues that face us so we can create a better future for ourselves and those to come. And now your host, Dr. Andrew Tisser. Hey guys, it's Andrew and welcome back to the Talk To Me Doc podcast. I am so happy you are here today. For our returning listeners, thank you so much for sticking with me. For our new listeners, stay tuned because on this episode, like every episode, I'm bringing you the best guests from all around healthcare and beyond to discuss issues relating to the early career physician. Today's show is testing out a new format, a panel interview with Drs. Chase Anderson and Carl Street. Dr. Chase Anderson is a former adult psychiatry resident physician at the Massachusetts General Hospital and McLean Hospital, now at UCSF for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Fellowship Training. He was born in Woodland Hills, California, and then moved to Seattle, Washington at age 12. He completed his undergraduate education in chemistry at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and his master's in biological engineering at MIT as well. He is a graduate of the Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine. His writing has appeared in the New York England Journal of Medicine, Stat News, In-House Magazine, Kevin MD, and Psychology Today, and centers around intersectionality, the LGBTQ+, and URM physician experience, and psychiatry. In his free time, he enjoys going for long walks, listening to K-pop, reading fantasy books, playing soccer, writing, and planning dinners with friends. Dr. Carl Streed Jr. is an assistant professor in the Boston University School of Medicine. After attending medical school and residency in internal medicine at Johns Hopkins, he completed fellowship in general internal medicine at Brigham and Women's. Nationally, he has chaired the American Medical Association Advisory Committee on LGBTQ issues and served on the board of GLMA, Health Professionals Advancing LGBTQ Equality. Carl's efforts to improve the health and well-being of sexual and gender minority individuals and communities have earned him several awards, notably from the University of Chicago Alumni Association, Johns Hopkins University Alumni Association, the American Medical Association Foundation, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, as well as recognition from the Obama White House. As the research lead for the Center for Transgender Medicine and Surgery at Boston Medical Center, he collaborates with researchers, physicians, and staff to assess and address the health and well-being of transgender and gender-diverse individuals. Well, guys, without further ado, let's welcome Chase and Carl onto the show. Doctors Carl Street and Chase Anderson, welcome to the Talk To Me Doc podcast. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. All right. So for the listeners, this is a new panel format. So ignore any technicalities. All right. Um, So uh, I already recorded a little bit about you guys. But uh, if in your own words, you can just give the listeners a little bit about who you are, what you do and your role in healthcare, And uh, you guys can fight over who goes first. Uh, so yeah, so I'm um, I go uh, I'm Carl, pronouns he him his, um, and I'm an assistant professor in medicine and a primary care doctor by training uh, with a significant focus on LGBTQ health um, advocacy, medical education, and research. Um, hi everyone, I'm Chase Anderson. I am a recent pediatric resident. I am now a psychiatry fellow at UCSF. Um, in terms of my study, I usually do a lot of writing about LGBT and underrepresented minority or URM health, um, as well as advocacy work surrounding that to make sure that other medical students and people who are minorities know they aren't alone. Awesome, guys. Well, thank you for coming on the show and for doing everything that you do. Um, 
I thought we would just get started a little bit on kind of your story and what you guys have experienced thus far uh, in, in your medical training along the way. So I'll, um, I'll go first. Well, I will say it's an age thing and the situation. Uh, so, uh, so my, so there was a few things with regards to my identity. So like I identify as a, like an out gay cis white man. Um, and there's a lot of different privileges associated with that in medicine. There's also some components of being out that, um, may have created some friction throughout uh, my training. Um, I would point out that I was out during my interview process for medical school onwards. Um, for my medical school during my interview, they were very explicit saying I could be out there and I could be supported there. Um, so I bought that. Um, and for the most part, it felt true. There, I'm going to share there are a few instances very explicitly where it was not the case. So um, just because the faculty say it doesn't mean all the students agree with that. So when uh, I remember during my first year of medical school, a classmate of mine um, saying, uh, in a group that there were, uh, they admitted too many gay people into our medical school. Um, and at, at that point when I was there, it was myself and another student in our class who were out and there were no other out students for the, uh, uh more senior three classes. So two, <laughs> two people for the nearly 500 students, uh, was too much apparently. Um, I distinctly remember just being livid about that and talking to some friends who were lawyers and they're like, if you replace if you if you replace that with any other minoritized group, you could easily go to a dean. Um, not that, not necessarily that the dean would do anything about it, but the dean would hear you. On this, nobody wanted to hear us uh, talk about that. Um, it was it was really frustrating. Um, the other thing that came up was as my career, as my interests were really moving more towards very specifically around sexual and gender minority health, around LGBTQ health. Um, uh, a faculty member uh, described my interest as superficial. Um, even though our curriculum very specifically was described as genes to society, apparently focusing on social determinants of health um, was uh, was superficial at that time. Um, as, so it, it being mentor, mentorship from faculty um, as a student. Uh, and thankfully, I was able to find that outside of uh, my institution uh, uh, for the most part. There's definitely a few bright uh, stars who were mentors at the institution, but for the most part, I definitely felt like I had to look elsewhere. Um, those are, I would say those are like the main, I would think those are, those are main examples, um, uh, in terms of really sticking out in my memory and kind of shaping my experience of, of training as a student. Yeah. Um, in my case, so I identify as African-American and I also identify as gay. Um, so intersectionality comes into play a lot for me. Um, there are a lot of studies talking about intersectionality and how you can get hit from both sides, um, sometimes, or it can also be protective in certain ways. So I've been out, I came out in fifth grade and then came out again multiple times over the course of my life. I was out when I applied to medical school as well as residency, as well as fellowship. Um, I very much wanted to be out to see how did people react to that as well as am I going to be safe here on some level? Um, I, I think I experienced what Carl did where you were told that you were safe and sometimes that is not always the case. Um, I was class president at Northwestern um, during medical school and heard from classmates that I had one class president because I was black and gay. Um, I also heard that, did I get in because there were a couple spots for gay people? Um, also, people asking about my degrees and things like that. And I was like, well, I have a degree from MIT from undergrad in chemistry. And, and it also comes from patients sometimes, but I think the issue that has come up for me is that those voices happen often enough that it's very loud. Um, but I have had very wonderful experiences as well. Hand out to me and actually helped change an institution with me. Um, and then a dean who also helped out during that time and some other allies. Um, so it made that experience more positive than it actually would have been without them. And then residency was very difficult. Um, I just published a piece in the New England Journal talking about some of my experiences there. And I think there were things about my gender expression and how not wearing a tie was unprofessional, even though people being racist wasn't unprofessional, apparently. Um, so I think I've had some tough experiences in residency as well. And that's why I actually went to a different place for a child fellowship. However, I really have to speak highly of my classmates in residency. Um, they really bonded together and our group was pretty diverse already, but people spoke out and actually our class is known for that. Um, so I feel very lucky to have them there, family. And I also was very lucky to be back at in Boston with my friends from college as well. So 
overall things have worked out really well for myself. I think I have a lot of privileges, um, socioeconomically and educationally that have shielded me. However, I know not everybody has that. So I always want to think about those things as well. Yeah, that's, thank you guys for sharing your stories. I mean, um, some of the, some of the things you shared just make me angry, um, which I can only imagine how you guys feel. Um, so thank you for that. It, it seems Ray, as Ray though... Rage is remarkable. I, I think, it, I, I think I, I'd, I'd interject, I'd say it, it, rage is a remarkable tool for wanting to create change. It's not necessarily a sustaining energy. It definitely can be draining, but it, uh, it, it can be a, a kind of a righteous rage to actually try and change anything. And I, I don't want to speak for Chase, but like for me, every time I got angry, I... It was like, okay, this is how I'm going to change. Like, I'm trying not to swear right now, but this is like how I'm <laughs> going to change this. This is this is who I'm going to talk to. This is what's going to happen to this faculty member or or this classmate or things like that. Um, and how we're going to create a coalition to try and address this. Um, and it was all coming from that personal rage or um, what I could, you could even describe as like empathetic rage, seeing what happens to other other classmates as well. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's. Also, like it makes me feel bad to think about how much of this was going on in my own medical school and for potentially in my training, uh, you know, without even knowing because, uh, no, I guess, well, why would I? Um, but, um, it's, yeah. So, but enough about me, the, uh, it, it seems as though you, you guys have had support, some support from within, but more support from without, from uh, beyond the medical institution and beyond your training. Um, can you guys talk a little bit more as to what has helped you along the way and help you get through some of the, some of the bad times? Yeah. Um, Carl, do you mind if I go first? Of course. Okay. Um, so I think my friends from MIT have been the most powerful people I've had in my life, um, as well as my own family members. My dad is a physician and had gone through a lot of experiences with racism. Um, so he and I actually can talk about those things. Um, and he has been really somebody I admire and I look up to. My mom and sister as well are like, they've done science work and our family is like a very tight unit. And that really helped during medical school. I think medical school and residency even brought us closer together than we were before. Um, they have been super supportive throughout. And I think the other thing is going back to my friends from college and graduate school. I think. I had friends who changed my life um, to be self-disclosing. I had depression since seventh grade and then it went away in, at the end of college. Came back during medical school because of racism and homophobia. Went away again later on because of meds and therapy for the first time in my life and then came back during um, residency. And it's gone again now because mine is minority stress driven in a lot of ways. Um, but even through that, my friends from college really stuck with me and actually even just a random text to be like, Hey, how are you doing? When I was in Chicago and they were still in Boston really helped. Um, so I think having those outside supports of what is happening to you is wrong and friends who can remind you of that. Um, it helps anchor you a little bit. So that's what helped me the most is having those outside forces to be like, the world isn't supposed to be like this. Yeah, I, I, uh, so my family is supportive, but definitely none of them have really experienced um, the, the my experience is kind of going through training um, the first uh, doctor in the family. Um, but uh, for me, I think it was very helpful to have some sort of friend group before going back into training. I took a few years off after under, undergrad before going into medicine. Actually worked at a gay bar, which provided a, a very strong kind of gay uh, network, as it were, that, of friends who were immediately... Support did come within um, within my institution for medical school and, and residency. Um, and some of it came very high up. Um, a president of one of the hosp uh, affiliated hospitals out and was a support. Um, I made sure to put also for our student group to create mentorship, and that led to a lot of different institutional change. But what really kind of drove a lot of my um, energies to keep doing work or to remain um, as outspoken as I was kind of came from or, um, organized um, medicine in some ways. So there's GLAMA, which GLMA um, 
used to stand for the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association. Now they're just Glamma. And that, for me, allowed it a, a significant uh, national network of out faculty members and out students um, to where I could share an experience with them um, remotely and we could talk things through and did a lot of different projects that way. And um, it, it kind of was the profession. I'll be like, oh, honey, I've already gone through that. Let me tell you how we handled it. Um, it sounds like nothing's really changed in medicine, which honestly, it sounds like things just keep repeating in some different way. Um, so it, those kind of networks were really critical, uh, both uh, within and, uh, and, and outside of uh, where I... Yeah, thank you guys uh, for sharing that. The uh, Do you feel that... With, I know you know you have your own, own experiences that you have, and you guys are connected with the greater community in the country. Do you feel that in medical school, you are somewhat more shielded or more protected from some of this versus in residency? Or is that, you know, too hard of a blanket statement to make? Or what what have you heard from different people? I... I... It, 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 it's, I find it quite variable. Um, and again, this kind of depends on what topic we're really talking about. Um, and I, I, it, sometimes it's a little glib, but honestly, like if I wasn't gay, I would have all the identities of the man. So I, I carry a lot of privilege as a result of that. <laughs> um, uh, but, but like that, that being said, like there were some unique experiences. Students do have a few more mechanisms that protect them. Residents and other trainees have a few more mechanisms that protect them. And then less so as you go further along. Um, I feel like I've become in some ways a little bit more exposed to potential consequences for how outspoken I am. Um, I, I definitely felt that when I was interviewing for fellowship and, and when I was interviewing for faculty jobs, who was willing to go to bat and who was making sure um, <laughs> or the notion of like, we don't do LGBT health at all. We don't see the value in it. We don't think you're going to get funded or maintained uh, in terms of doing that career. And, and I say that now in half gloating, having two career development grants focused on LGBTQ health at this point. So it's, um, I, I have felt a little bit more exposed um, as I've moved through my training, but uh, again, it's one of those situations where it, it, it's, it's in direct response to the work I'm doing, not necessarily so much, I think, my identity at this point. Um, I think in terms of being more exposed, um, I think I have been very fortunate that I figure out very quickly how to make alliances. Um, that is a very self-protective thing that I have done throughout my life because at Northwestern, I had a vice dean who really reached out and worked together and another dean who worked together as well. Um, and then in residency, I had my classmates and I also had my friends from outside of residency as well. Um, and built alliances during residency too. So I've actually felt the reverse almost where I feel less exposed as time goes on because I think I have established myself more and more and more quickly each time. Um, and that's something that I think is unique in some ways. Not every team reach out to them. It will depend on your institution. It will have variables. And so what we want to do is take a step back and think about like what are these variables and how they're playing in and how do we level the playing field for everybody because Carl and I are very different. Like I am African American, he is not. Um, but we have faced some very similar things. So how do we figure out across the spectrum? Like how do we make sure that all minority people are safe? Um, is how I always try to think about it. That was a good and, point. And I think, and, and this is one of the reasons why I think it's it's good that you're trying this new format for your cast in terms of having a panel because the situation that other people have with different identities. This panel right now, um, without making too many assumptions, is pretty much all, it's a mantle at this point, as much as we try to avoid those. Um, and so we're not getting the experience of people who, uh, who are women. We're not getting the experience of people who are other gender identities as well. And we know that medicine has additional hardships placed on women and on other gender minorities. And uh, you can even look at the fact uh, of how women continue to report issues of that are not, in fact, them being a doctor. Um, and while all professions are great, it, it is often disparaging um, when somebody is not acknowledged for their training. Um, and, and then, of course, the issue of if you look at, honestly, how many people can be out as a, not as a gender minority, as a trans individual in training, is much lower um, than it ought to be to represent the population. So I just want to bring, bring to light that um, this is a new format for you. <laughs> Tried to make sure that we had a, a, a additional representation, but acknowledging that it is still a panel at this point. Very true. <laughs> Very true. Um, the, uh, you know, they, some of what you're saying brings kept me into kind of my next part is, so uh, I know you guys are, are both very 
active in different ways. So Chase, you're with your writing and Carl uh, with your advocacy work and, and everything you're doing. Um, so, how, you know, how do we help? How do we change the narrative? Um, how does a, a uh, white male like myself that is very uh, privileged and hasn't experienced any of these issues um, help uh, going forward besides having our little panel here and, and getting this out to the masses? Manel, excuse me. <laughs> um, I think that's an excellent question. It's something that minorities are asked a lot. Um, and I think the first thing is what I have always appreciated is somebody coming to the table and saying, these are the things I know about diversity and about your possible experience. However, I do not know your individual experience. I know about these things that were like with regards to racism. I know about these things with regards to women's rights. I know about these things with regards to trans health. However, I will admit that I do not know everything. So asking consent before asking a person that, like those questions. If somebody comes to me and they're like, what's it like to be black? I'm like, hello, my name's Chase. I'm a <laughs> person. It's so good to meet you. Um, I really love the mentors who ask me, start out by, I have a mentor who took me to coffee one time and didn't bring up race the whole time at the beginning. And instead she asked something that was very poignant. She said, tell me, me your story of how you got to be a doctor. Um, and I think that was just beautiful because I think psychiatry is all about words. And so she let me tell my own narrative. Uh, um, UCSF also did that when I interviewed and that was actually very much why I loved it. Um, they, every interviewer said, what is your story? Um, and it let me have ownership over my own story and the pieces I wanted to tell because there are plenty of minorities who don't want to talk about it some days. And it's exhausting. If we look at America right now with what's happening with Black Lives Matter, with what's happening in Iowa and other places and anti-trans bills that are going through, people are under constant threat. And so somebody forcing you to tell them your experience can also feel like a threat sometimes too. But I think somebody saying, I want to know who you are as a person and you can tell me whatever you want to tell me about yourself that gives that person that ownership and makes them feel a little bit safer. Again, not everybody. And I think we need to be more nuanced in how we do this because some people will want to talk about race at the get-go. Some people will not. So asking for consent before that's brought up is a big thing that I have really appreciated. I've had mentors who say, I know you are an African-American gay male and I have to, but I will stand for you and advocate for you. And people who say that and then follow it up with words, like when a patient calls me the n-word or another attendant gets my name on and calls me the other african-american's name in our program and i see somebody stand up for me then but those are the big things that i would say help is first it's words and then making sure there's action behind them as well and that chase has said and i think it's it's really it's really critical to make sure that if you are going to say it that you actually are going to act through it um i'm i'm very tired of what i described as performative allyship the notion of you put up a, like a rainbow sticker, you put up a, a, a BLM a hashtag and stuff and then done nothing else. Like that is, that is not it. And that's not going to, that's not going to change anything. I mean, I think the one thing I often try to um, model or remind people of is like, you just need to be way more aware that like how you experience the world is not how everybody else is experiencing it. Um, and therefore recognizing where things have been easy for you and where they've been hard for others. Um, based on certain uh, certain identities, based on how we've structured things, is really important. Um, the other thing I'm, I'm I feel like I, I definitely, as I've gotten older, sometimes I feel um, a little bit more uh, reified in, in that uh, I've moved from like what I describe as activism to advocacy in terms of the notion of protesting on the outside and trying to change a system on the inside and recognizing that both have to happen um, to actually achieve anything. So. If you're going to say something and you're going to do something, it's important to be able to do it at the, at the individual and interpersonal level. But I want you to then take it to the next level. I want you to demand it of leadership. I want you to demand it in the policies and things that are written. Um, that said, I don't want you to just change the policy and say everything's fixed because that's also not true. This is, this is something that requires multi-level interventions. Um, and a lot of that um, it requires you to do it, do work for yourself, as well as making sure that you're encouraging this system to actually change. Um, and I, I really have to uh, give credit to what Chase and others have really shared is you're actively living through personal trauma and to be queried constantly 
is exhausting and can be dehumanizing. So really, I, I like how Chase said, you need to ask consent for if, if you're asking very specific, specific personal questions. Because I definitely remember, <laughs> I definitely remember in high school, like people asking like, what's it like to be a gay person? Or like, what, like in this Christian town, and I'm just like, let's take a break. You are not like you are not automatically privileged to get to know what my experience is right now at this moment. Um, let's get to know each other and, and, and build a, an actual trusting relationship first. So, um, yeah, I, I, again, I echo everything Chase said, and I, I encourage people to really think at different levels for what's happening because it, it isn't just a number of small, a few bad actors. It's the system has has this baked into it at this point. Yeah, and I mean, those are some great points to consider. The, you know, I think a lot of people would not would not even consider that asking permission to get your story. So, um, thank you for saying that. I I think that's a lot to to think about. Um, and uh, you know, going forward, I, I you know my audience is is mostly either residents or or physicians that are early in their career. Um, so, with two sides of the coin for. Uh, those experiencing uh, racism on every level, um, or uh, those who are um, either trying to promote a culture of inclusive inclusivity, I believe is the word. Yeah. All right. Um, how uh, you know what advice do you do you give to those people going forward? Um, perhaps they you know they they're not trying to get involved on a national level, but they want to make sure that uh, everyone at their facility. Uh, is not a victim or is not perpetrating some of this? What, what kind of advice can you give? I mean, I would, I, 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 this, we like to tout that we are lifelong learners. And then whenever we're faced with a, what we describe as a tough situation, we're like, oh, I don't know about that. I, I really can't go bother to learn about that. When I'm like, you just said you're a lifelong learner as part of the profession. I need you to like go out there. There, are, And I'll say at this point, like, and I actually, I've been, I've had this bizarre habit of like collecting syllabuses from, from friends who are professors or people who are doing work of like, this is, this is reading around anti-racism. This is reading about historical context and present context of, of queer rights and queer liberation movements and so forth. So th there's plenty of written out there for you to learn on your own. Um, I think that's a really good place to start, but I think you really need to recognize how much power you do have as a health professional to speak up and, and uh, honestly make some difference at minimum in your interpersonal relationships and your patients' lives. Those one-on-one -on -one interactions are something I think you have the most power over. There are definitely times when you feel powerless, but honestly, you just have to recognize how much power you do carry. But then to carry that forward into larger, uh, larger context, I would say. Yeah, I would echo what Carl was saying. That was really eloquent and beautiful. Um, I agree with all of that. Because when I think about some things that happen in med school, I was like, these people have become physicians. And if you were silent during all that stuff that happened with race, with your classmates, with your class president who was looking out for you, what are you doing with patients to actually advocate for them if they're a minority coming to your office? Are you actually like, are you following through with things? Are you working as hard for them? Are you doing the things you need to for them? Um, and so I always think about that. And I think one of the things that I really draw upon is actually the culture at MIT. Um, I've never seen a better culture um, in my lifetime. I think it's very much Star Trek future. Um, and not to be like a complete nerd, but it is. Um, We're all nerds, man. Yeah, like it's, <laughs> it's very much like a Disneyland as well, where if you can think it, then you can do it. And I remember when somebody mentioned that African-American people got in because of affirmative action. And our provost actually said, so we don't have that. It's a meritocracy. And this is exactly how it works. And it was done, like wrote it in our school newspaper and everybody read it. Everybody talked about it. It was amazing. Um, and I think even on the interpersonal level, I remember in college, somebody at a fraternity making fun of how I moved my hands. And I had a lot of friends by then. And one of my friends went over and pulled them aside and actually told them to stop doing that. And they never did it again. And there are people from that, like who learn and are like some of my best allies now. Um, I think in medicine, there's a fear and a culture of telling people not to speak up, not only for themselves, but also for other people around them. And how are you taking that to your patients? Um, what does that mean for patient care? So always thinking about that. And then also thinking about what Carl was saying about physicians have a lot of power. You have the power to speak up. You have a voice. You have a platform. You have an MD. Um, so think about how you use it. I think the other big thing is 
if a school says it has a zero tolerance policy, what does that actually mean in real time? Um, Because I've seen at multiple institutions, multiple places, we have a zero tolerance policy for racism. We have a zero tolerance policy for this, that, and the other. And how does that play out in real time? Because I think a lot of those people and professors still have those jobs. And if not, like they probably actually got promoted sometimes. And you're like, well, what did that mean? And the people who experienced those parts of discrimination actually leave. Um, So thinking about what does zero tolerance mean to you and how are you actually enacting that in your own place? Because I think some people are not big players who are going to like write op-eds or like go and do like advocacy work or go to the government and town halls and things like that. And that's okay. I think everybody is learning how to be an advocate in their own way. And like Carl is very much like he goes and speaks and he does presentations. That is not my thing because I get really nervous. So mine is writing. So how do you advocate? Um, So things like that. If it makes you feel better, I feel like I'm going to die every time I talk. (laughs) (laughs) We just push through it, right? Exactly. Well, you know, that, that kind of ties in. We, um, the three of us had had a little conversation before this show and I had told you guys that my wife is uh, taking over uh, as in a faculty position of power for a uh, medicine residency of about 150 residents as of, uh, well, we'll see when this comes out, but as of tomorrow of this recording. Um, <laughs> and so she, she had a few questions if I could ask you guys if that'd be all right with you. Um, Fire away. So the first one kind of ties into my last point is um, as she's kind of coming in and trying to recreate a program and and make it her own um, as a young physician and as a a woman young physician, um, how can she try to ensure a culture um, with her residents that that promotes, you know, promotes inclusivity um, and is supportive to both um, other races and LGBTQ, uh, identified individuals. Uh, you know, she, she worries as to how she can create a culture that it is a safe space for those, you know, without, um, you know, I guess that's the question. Um, so do you mind if I go first, Carl? Okay. Um, I think one of the big things that I have seen really be effective and it's something I've started to utilize is, I remember when attendings, when I first would meet them, would actually sit down with me at the end of the day and say, hey, this is how things work here. This is what we do. Have very clear expectations uh, um, and follow through on those, as well as say, if anything untoward happens, let me know um, because we want to keep you safe. And that's actually what I, as a resident, I did that with medical students. and I did that with my classmates when I was in medical school um, of taking people aside and saying, Hey, like things might be hard here. However, you're not alone. And there's somebody who appreciates you as you are, and we will grow together. I think just setting that tone from day one makes somebody feel a little bit safer and think to themselves, somebody took me aside and took the time out of their busy day because we all know physicians are busy and writing orders and seeing patients. But somebody took the time out of their day to sit down with me and then do clear expectations as well as say that they understand that things are going to be hard in some ways, but that they're there for them. Um, I think that is huge to setting the culture. The other thing is to make sure to follow through on that. It goes back to the zero tolerance policy. So when you're with a medical student in the room, and if it's a female physician or female medical student, and somebody says something like a patient or another colleague saying, you know, that is not appropriate in person in real time is one of the most powerful things you might not necessarily change that person who said those things, but you will create a culture that shows that that is not tolerated and that that person is supported. Um, Those have always been powerful experiences for me. I had a patient call me the N word and I said, we're not going to do that right now. And I set a limit and my attending actually stopped rounds as well to help out with that. Um, And then called me later and just asked how I was doing. So I think that was, he's one of my favorite attendings and it was so easy because it was just one moment and I was so in awe of that because I hadn't seen that before. Um, So those kind of things. And also the other thing is making sure that your wife has colleagues who support her. Um, We are trying to do a culture shift in medicine and that is really hard. 
and having colleagues who support you makes it a little bit easier. Naturally, I agree with everything Chase has said. I, the, the, the word that you, you used a few times that I, I definitely feel is critically important and, and was something that I felt like I needed as, as a trainee and as a learner and something I tried to do uh, with my own uh, students and trainees. And I was like, really clear expectations and doing that as soon as possible because people, don't, people can't begin to understand how they measure their own personal success or their success within the hierarchy or the system but also how we are expected to behave if you don't set those expectations. Um, and I, again, totally echo what Chase says in terms of like, follow through on what you're saying. If you say something is not tolerated or this is the kind of behavior we reward, actually do that. Um, and and there definitely were situations where my faculty were great and they said one thing, but they did not follow through. Like I, I, lived, during, I lived through uh, the the initial uprising in Baltimore um, after another example of police brutality happened then. Um, I love my faculty. They are very social justice oriented. They, they acknowledge that they did not respond soon enough within the program to say, what's our role as physicians to respond to on society? And what's our role for making sure that we are protecting each other from things that are set? Like what happened to you, Chase, has definitely happened to some of my colleagues. And it was a matter of who was in the room or that they were even, one, aware of that <laughs> being a problem in some way, but also feeling equipped to be or, or know that they would be backed up by the system if they were to say something to a patient. Um, and there, there are definitely situations where I felt like I was going out on a limb and I didn't know if I had support. Um, and there were definitely other, uh, other times where I knew immediately that the faculty were there to back you up. That, I think, needs to be really something um, uh, that is made clear and explicit within the program that your wife is running. And I, I would say there's a, a unique opportunity being somebody new um, in, in that you can make, she, I don't, don't want to say just like her, but like this is to anybody, like you can make it your own and you can really push a little bit more, I think at the beginning than you would if you were just carrying it forward from somebody else, um, just the same. Um, and I, again, I've also there are many people who are trying to do this work more purposefully and more explicitly, um, it, it's important to find colleagues who will provide that uh, support outside of the system uh, she's in. What about those residents that come from more conservative cultures? How do we include that? I would say, again, this gets to what Chase was saying and, and what we were saying earlier, expectations. I'm, I'm admittedly, I, I wish I could, but I'm not, I don't expect, I don't expect to change your beliefs. I do expect to change your professional behavior and how you conduct yourself around patients and your colleagues. Um, because at the end of the day, you are entering a profession and we are looking to build and foster behaviors that reach for the ideals of the profession um, and really serve serve other people and serve our communities. Um, as much as I'd love to change your beliefs, honestly, that's not really what I really want to push for because I, I, I'm not going to please... I'm not going to be policing your beliefs. I'm not going to be policing your mind, but I will be policing your behavior and how that affects people around you. Yeah, I really love that um, because we can't change people unless they want to change themselves. What we can do also is create an environment where change is expected um, or change is okay. Because I think I want to take a step back and realize a lot of people come in with implicit biases. We all have them. Um, it's what do you do about them? How do you enact them? And then also, how do you work on them? And do we create a culture where it's okay to express those biases in a way that is cognizant of other people who are around you, as well as showing that you want to grow because of them and you recognize that they are biases? Um, because sometimes people don't even recognize them at the beginning. So we always have to think about where is somebody coming from? What biases are they bringing in? And I think that this is why I love psychiatry. It goes back to a person's story. Um, so setting that tone from the beginning and what we did in our fraternity when I was in college was we would actually have conversations where you would go out. I, this is going to be hard in med school, obviously, but we would go out with an individual and spend the day with them. And we would just say from birth until now, what is your story that you want to tell? Um, because nobody looks like me, to be honest. I have never met somebody else in medicine who looked like me. I have neon hair, have to look out everybody else who might be similar to me in some way. Um, but it has always come back to what is your story and what is my story? Because there are a lot of common threads. We all have felt like outsiders in some way. So there's always a common link between people. 
Um, and I want to echo what Carl was saying about making sure that you set those expectations that we will treat each other with respect. Um, and then also being okay with, this is a culture of learning and this is a culture where we are all, all going to grow and let's foster an environment where that is okay to do so um, as well. A lot to unpack there. Thank you. Uh, the, Yes, I think expectations is the word of the day, but uh, cultural learning, well, I mean, we, we go through residency to become like the best attending physicians we can be, right? So um, this is all part of that as well. Uh, and whereas um, we've talked a lot about communication on this show in the past um, and how it is not a quote soft skill um, and must be practiced. Uh, just like um, using a scalpel and anything else. Um, so I think that's that's an important point to bring up in regards to residency training. Um, um, mm-hmm. Good points there. Absolutely. Well, we're getting a little short on time, guys. But uh, this, this part of the show, I usually like to just get to know the guests a little bit better. Um, so uh, what do you guys like to do for fun? <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, uh, Carl, I'll go first to give you time. Oh, this question's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually pretty introverted by nature. A lot of friends were surprised when they found that out, and I was actually surprised. I didn't figure it out until medical school. Um, I used to go to parties all the time and hang out with a lot of people, but MIT is made up of a lot of introverts. So I was like, oh, that's why. Um, and so I actually like going for four hour walks. Um, I put my headphones in and I listen to like Korean pop music and Disney music and like musicals and like top 40. And then I just go for walks and it helps me de-stress. Um, I think as a psychiatrist, I deal with taking in a lot of stories and a lot of trauma that other people have had. Um, and so it helps purge that a little bit and just let those things go um, by going for those walks. Um, I also really love planning group dinners um, and having people who maybe haven't met meet each other because I think I'm very lucky that I am. I think everybody has potential to be amazing. Um, So why can't we all meet and be amazing together and learn from each other? Um, And then clubbing sometimes, but obviously (laughs) with coronavirus, I'm not. Like, I just want to put that out there. Yeah, (laughs) very good. Um, But I'm excited to also explore SF. So getting to know the area because I live in the Castro now. And I I specifically decided to live here because I thought it would be cool to live with a lot of other gay people for once. I am very similar. Like, people are always shocked. I'm very much an introvert. Like... (laughs) Very few things feel as good as somebody else canceling plans on me. I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> or, or like that moment when you're like, when I'm done giving a presentation, I'm like, oh, I can finally breathe again. Um, <laughs> so I similarly, I'm, uh, I, I, there are times where I just prefer to be very solitary. I, I, I devour as much as uh, in terms of reading as I can, oftentimes not medicine related. Um, uh, and uh, Naturally, also like very much more uh, in terms of physical activity. I love biking, although I, I must say I've been really bad. I haven't done a century in some time. Um, <laughs> I used to do that. I used to organize charity uh, rides with organizations. So those were always, for me, moments of being in a group, but being away from everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like Chase, I like what I, I used to to describe them as uh, like little affairs. So like I would have normally like a seasonal fall affair of like people gathering for around the uh, different holidays. Um, um, And then, yeah, I feel like that's the most, the one thing I definitely feel like I miss the most that feeds my introversion, but also still um, is kind of, I'm just reading in a cafe and I don't know when I'm ever going to be able to be back in a cafe of any kind, just reading and people watching and maybe running into friends. Um, yeah, that's 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 some of the, the harder parts of what's going on right now. But I, that that's was also fun for me. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, one of my recent guests said she loved reading at Barnes and Noble so much that now she just sits in the parking lot at Barnes and Noble and reads. Right? <laughs> I was like, that's kind of sad, though. That's like a little. <laughs> that's a little strange. <laughs> that's, that's a little really much. <laughs> but um, how, well, awesome guys. You know, uh, this. It really has been a lot of fun. Usually at this point, I ask for a piece of advice for early career physicians, but I feel like this whole show has been a piece of advice for early career physicians. So um, I think we could leave that out. But if you guys have any closing remarks that you want to give to the audience, um, 
please? Um, I think, thank you, first of all, for doing this. This is really awesome. And it's been an honor to be a part of this and also to be with Carl while doing this too. Um, and I think the biggest thing that I would say is be yourself. Um, unless you're mean to people, then like change that, please. But <laughs> Be yourself because I think you got into medicine for a reason and you have a lot more to you than some people might see. Don't forget that um, because that's what makes you special. So mm -hmm. that's what I would say. Echoing everything uh, that Chase has said, uh, but I want to add remembering how much power you do have. I mean, you're listening to this, you're an early career uh, clinician. Um, you you automatically have a lot of privilege and power within our social structures at this point. So if you want to see something change, it's it's a matter of building a coalition and really getting out there. Um, and I definitely I acknowledge as an introvert, sometimes you just want to stay home and not do anything. <laughs> but it, you know, it'd make you happier if you if you exercise some of that power. Sure, that's very powerful, guys. The uh, if people want to reach you or find out more about what you're doing, is there a good way to find you guys? Unless you don't want to be found, you know, there's that. No, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I, I, however you want to put it on your webpage, um, um, I a few different places, but I think one, um, so uh, fairly active on Twitter. So it's CJ Street, S T R E E D, um, is my handle. And then um, I have my, there are professional accounts at Boston University where I'm on faculty. Um, and for me, I'm on Twitter as well. And mine is at Chase TM Anderson, um, S O N. And then also, I, I guess, finding me through UCSF. I don't think we have our professional page up yet, but it will be there eventually. <laughs> so, all right. Well, I'll put the links to that in the show notes. Um, guys, I really want to thank you again for coming on here and being vulnerable and sharing your story. Um, I did ask permission, so uh, <laughs> yes, you <he> did. <laughs> I did. Ask. did um, excellent job. <laughs> thank yes, you. Very well done. But uh, I learned a lot, and I'm probably going to listen to this a couple of times. So uh, thank you guys again, and uh, best of luck in everything you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Best of luck to your wife taking on that program. Oh, she'll need okay. it, man. <laughs> she'll be awesome. <laughs> Thanks, guys. What a thoughtful and thought-provoking episode this was with Dr. Street and Dr. Anderson. I thought it was interesting how Carl shares his story of being out prior to medical school and discrimination he felt despite claims otherwise. Chase discusses intersectionality and how he did not always feel supported or safe, also if he was told otherwise. Dr. Anderson relied on his residency classmates for support, but his college friends were his biggest support system. He also discusses his struggles with depression. Carl discusses support he had at his institution and the greater gay community, both locally and nationally. Dr. Street felt that he had less protection as he progressed through his training and into his career. Chase really stresses the importance of asking permission before asking a person to tell their story. Carl stressed the importance of action behind words and systemic change, and that leadership can promote a culture of safety by setting clear expectations. This was a powerful episode, guys. I really learned a lot from Carl and Chase and really enjoyed talking with them. I hope that no matter where you are practicing, you will continue to advocate for your colleagues and foster a culture of inclusivity and tolerance. That's all I have for today, guys. Thank you again for listening to the Talk To Me Doc podcast. For my early career physicians out there, I have a Facebook group called Early Career Physicians Taking Back Medicine. Please jump in there and join the conversation. For everyone else, if you wouldn't mind giving me a honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts, I really do appreciate it. Please contact me at any time at andrew at talktomedocpod.com. That's andrew at talk, the number two, me, D-O-C-P-O-D.com with any questions or feedback. I look forward to talking to you guys next week. And remember, keep talking.
All opinions expressed by the guests in this episode are solely the guests' opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Andrew Tisser Dio, TalkToMe.LC, or any affiliates thereof. The guests' opinions are based upon information he or she considers reliable, but Andrew Tisser Dio, TalkToMe.LC, nor any affiliates thereof warrant its completeness or accuracy. The guests, Andrew Tisser Dio, TalkToMe.LC, or any affiliates thereof are not under any obligation to update or correct any information provided in this episode. The guest statements and opinions are subject to change without notice.